What is up insaners and welcome to our midweek review video of game week 26. We are halfway through the biggest double game week in FPL's history and there are a lot of things to discuss. Now one of the biggest concerns of this game week is the injury blow to Harvey Barnes which might make him unavailable for the next 6 weeks. So we'll talk about some possible replacements. Mo Salah and Bruno Fernandes also blanked in their games and we'll throw some light on whether it's time to replace both and go for someone like a KDB who has low ownership at the moment or even the Spurs duo of Son and Bale who had a great first game against Burnley. We'll also see how we're doing so far this week, along with some early thoughts on potential transfers for Game Week 27. Lots of good stuff coming up, so if you enjoyed today's video and find it useful, make sure you hit the like button, subscribe to our channel Insanely Football if you're new around here and would like to see more FPL content. Also, don't forget to press the bell icon if you want to get notified of our coming videos. With everything set, let's look into what's happened in this game week so far. Man City started this week against a very impressive West Ham side and it was a tough game for the citizens. Pep started with Sergio Aguero and Kevin De Bruyne, benching Joao Cancelo, Raheem Sterling and Phil Foden. A lot of FPL managers had at least one of them in their teams and it would definitely hurt them seeing these players not start. City looked a bit rusty and found it difficult to break down West Ham. De Bruyne though bought the first action of the game, perfectly assisting Ruben Diaz's first City goal. It was a great all-around goal from KDB's pinpoint ball to Diaz's header. Mikel Antonio then gave the Hammers a deserved leveller before the break. The second half was tense and John Stones finally came to City's rescue to give them their 20th straight win in all competitions. Second game was West Brom against Brighton and probably the most bizarre game of the season. West Brom won the game 1-0 as Brighton failed to score two penalties and were controversially denied a goal by VAR. Lewis Dunk found the net with a quick free kick after referee Lee Mason gave him a go-ahead but then he realised that the West Brom keeper Johnston was not ready and he blew the second whistle before the ball had crossed the line. The referee came under more pressure as first he disallowed the goal, then he allowed it and ultimately the goal didn't stand. There was just too much chaos in the moment, the win gave West Brom a slight glimmer of hope and Brighton would be very disappointed not to get anything from the game where they could have easily scored two or more goals. The next game was Leeds vs Aston Villa, with Jack Grealish still ruled out with a mysterious unknown injury, the prospects of an Aston Villa win against Marco Bielsa's team looked slim. Villa was strong defensively and came with all three points. This game also saw a change in formation for Dean Smith. Nakamba and Ramsey came in for the out-of-form Barkley and Douglas Luiz. The formation also changed to 4-3-3 and looked much better. Leeds themselves were below par in this game, but one should credit the Villa defence for keeping their main players in Rafinha and Patrick Bamford quiet. Aston Villa won a league game without Jack Grealish for the first time since April 2019, proving that they're not just a one-man team. From an FPL point of view though, it was a blank for all the Leeds players and surely managers were hoping for a better result, at least from an attacking point of view. Newcastle then faced Wolves in a very important game for the Toon Army. Lascelles headed the host in front from Ryan Fraser's cross in the second half and they looked good for their lead after a confident performance. But Ruben Neves, who had never scored a headed goal for Wolves before, was awarded space to guide Preto Neto's ball beyond Dubravka to earn the visitors a point. Newcastle missed a number of opportunities of their own, with Almiron striking the far post after breaking the offside trap early in the first half. It should have been 3 points to Newcastle and they still find themselves well into the relegation battle. Fulham could not make their dominance play against a lacklustre Crystal Palace, a nil-nil draw at Sellers Park, leaving them 3 points from safety at the bottom. Neither side managed to shorten target in the first half, but with Ruben Loftus-Cheek dictating the second half, Fulham passed up chance after chance to put the pressure on the relegation rivals above. Overall, Fulham dominated the game but just came away with a single point. Nevertheless, it was a good result for FPL managers who had players from the Fulham defence and they got a decent clean sheet from the game. Now guys, let's talk about Leicester City vs Arsenal. The Gunners came away with an impressive 3-1 away win after falling behind in the game. The first real attack of any note resulted in a goal as Steelman's attacked down the right and Arsenal defence simply continued to back off. That allowed the Belgian to go all the way and he drilled a low finish in the bottom corner. For Arsenal, Nicolas Pepe was denied a penalty originally given after a VR review spotted the foul was outside the area. The turnaround just came before the break though as Williams free kick was headed in by David Luiz and Alexander Lacazette smashed home a penalty given after a Wilfred NDD handball. Brendan Rodgers made a change at the break and was forced into another straight after the restart but Pepe quickly tapped home a third after a brilliant counter attack and the Foxes were unable to get back in the game. Leicester at the moment look a bit wounded. The biggest concern would be the knee injury to Harvey Barnes. Brendan Rodgers will be desperately hoping that his knee injury isn't too severe but by the looks of it, he might need surgery and could be out for 6 weeks. Not great news for FPL managers as he was the most transferred in player in game week 26 and would now need replacement. 
Gareth Bale produced his most impressive performance since returning to Tottenham with two goals in a 4-0 win over Burnley on Sunday. Bale made only his third league start of the season with the opening goal after only 2 minutes, finishing in from close range. He then set up Harry Kane for Tottenham's second after 15 minutes before Lucas Moura made it 3-0 before half-time. Bale then claimed his second goal of the game with a clinical finish after 55 minutes as Tottenham returned to form in the league, having lost 5 of their previous 6 games. The victory left Tottenham in 8th spot with 39 points from 25 games and revived their hopes of finishing in the top 4. Bale is showing great form and he has now scored 4 times in his last 4 appearances in all competitions. Although he did not register in the loss against West Ham last week, he was eye-catching as a second-half substitute. Looking fit and sharp, Bale linked up superbly with Kane and Son as manager Jose Mourinho unleashed a trio against a Burnley side who were there for the taking. Chelsea and Man United played out a fairly uneventful 0-0 draw their second of the season. Neither team were fully prepared to take the risk needed to win the game, an understandable decision considering the tricky fixtures both teams are facing. Both created decent transition openings, mainly in the second half, but ultimately there was not enough quality or willingness to win the game. Chelsea picked up a slow front three and opted for a possession game to tackle with United's threat on the counter. United, on the other hand, were all too happy to pick up a point away at a rival. For Chelsea, it is a point gained over last season in the middle of a hectic run of games. While all three points would have been sweet, it is understandable why Tuchel opted for a defensive-minded setup with games against Liverpool, Everton and Leeds United coming up. It is going to be fascinating to see how he prepares his team for this run of fixtures. Liverpool ended their four-match losing run and moved to within two points of the top four with a 2-0 win against Sheffield United. The heroics of Sheffield United goalkeeper Aaron Ramsdale had frustrated Liverpool as he made five first-half saves, including two in as many minutes to deny Mo Salah and Wijnaldum. Liverpool eventually found a way past Ramsdale on 48 minutes when Jagielka's clearance from a Trent Alexander-Arnold cross fell for Jones to stroke in just for his second Premier League goal. The win could have been greater had Salah not missed an open goal from a tight angle late on. Liverpool moved a point behind 5th place Chelsea, their next opponents, while Sheffield United stay bottom 15 points from safety. Our last game of the first round of fixtures was Everton vs Southampton. Richarlison scored for the third successive match as Everton beat Southampton 1-0 to move level on points with Liverpool. The Brazilian who scored against Man City and Liverpool in his previous two matches collected a through ball from Sigurdsson and rounded the Saints goalkeeper to slot home in the ninth minute. Michael Keane almost doubled the Toffees' lead, but his header was overturned for offside against Mason Holgate after a VAR review. Dominic Calvert-Lewin too went close after the break but couldn't finish. Everton remained 7th but move on to 43 points, only behind Liverpool on goal difference and with a match in hand on everyone above them. Southampton on the other hand are now winless in 9 Premier League matches and stay 14th on 30 points, 7 above the relegation zone. That completes the first round of fixtures for this week. Seven fixtures are still to be played including a big one where the current champions Liverpool face Thomas Tuchel's Chelsea. Now let's look at how our team is doing for this week. To be honest, we've got 67 points but it has not been a great week. Most of our midfielders and forwards have planked this game week with a possible injury to Martinez in goal. He had a tight groin which stopped him playing out a little bit with the centre-backs taking the goal kicks. We were a bit lucky with both of our City defenders scoring in the game and getting a double-digit haul in spite of not keeping a clean sheet against the Hammers. But I feel that's about it. Harvey Barnes also got that knee injury and we would definitely have to replace him next week. Kane got a goal against Burnley but being involved in only one goal when Spurs scored four is a bit disappointing. Obviously there are more fixtures to come and things could look very different by the end of this week. We are still on a small green arrow improving by around 20k spots, hoping for a better second round of games. Now we talked about the Harvey Barnes injury earlier, he requires a surgery on his knee and is out for a minimum of 6 weeks. Unfortunately, it's a bad one for him and a huge blow for Leicester City. Rogers mentioned in his post-match that a bit of bone in his knee has come off so it needs to be repaired. More than a million managers bought him in for game week 26 and let's look at some replacements for the Leicester City attacker. We start with Jesse Lingard. The West Ham attacker has sprung into life after making his loan move from Man United. He has started every game since his arrival, scoring 3 goals and providing 2 assists in 5 starts. He has looked sharp going forward and David Moyes has been spot on to play him in the team week in week out. One thing to note is that he won't be eligible to play against Man United in game week 28, so if we can manage to keep him on the bench for that week, he's looking like a solid replacement for Barnes. Our second option is Ilkay Gundogan. He has been the mainstay in City's midfield this season. He has scored 4 goals and 2 assists across the last 5 game weeks. Though he hasn't secured any attacking returns since KDB's return, he could still be a good double up attacking option for Man City. We next come to James Rodriguez. The Colombian international was rested in the game against Southampton but should feature in the game against West Brom. He has created 4 chances along with an XG of 0.46 
and an expected assist of 0.61 across his last 5 game weeks. With Everton having a good run of fixtures in the coming weeks, he could be a great replacement for Barnes if you have the extra money. Our next pick is a bit surprising and controversial at the same time. Diogo Jota from Liverpool Jota was in electric form earlier this season before getting injured. He returned to training prior to game week 26 but didn't feature against Sheffield United. With his ownership dropping down to only about 2% and a price around the 6 million mark, he could be a great differential shout for Liverpool's next run of fixtures. The next couple of options we have are from Aston Villa. Anwar El Ghazi was by no means an assured starter when Jack Grealish was playing, but with the Aston Villa talisman out for some time, Al Ghazi could be a great punt for the next few weeks. He scored a double digit haul in his last start against Leeds United, and he also has a fixture in game week 29, making him a risky but a hugely rewarding choice. El Ghazi's teammate and Aston Villa captain Jack Grealish could be another great option if he's fit to play in game week 27. Grealish has been out for the past two Villa games because of an injury picked up in the build up to last week's 2 1 defeat to Leicester City. The England international also missed the 1 0 win at Leeds United on Saturday night. Dean Smith mentioned it's a lower leg injury, he had some discomfort so he went to see the doctor and they decided that he needed a period of rest until he was pain free. He also mentioned that he believes Jack Grealish is very close to being pain free now and as such as the player, he'll want to play as soon as he can. So who are you getting this week for Harvey Barnes? Do let us know in the comments below. Another challenge that a lot of managers would face this game week would be to decide what to do with premium players like Bruno Fernandes and Mo Salah. They were popular captain and triple captain choices in game week 26 but both planked in their respective games, frustrating their FPL managers. Now what should we do with Bruno Fernandes? Let's look at this in more detail. There is no denying that Bruno Fernandes has been a sensational signing for Manchester United. Since joining the Red Devils from Sporting Lisbon in January last year, the Portuguese midfielder has been directly involved in 54 goals in 61 appearances for the club. However, the 26-year-old has been less effective for the Red Devils in matches against the so-called Big Six this season. He flattered to deceive once again against the top six opposition in the shape of Chelsea on Sunday. Some of his stats from the match make for a concerning reading for United fans. Fernandes lost possession more times than any other player, was dribbled past the most times, only created one chance, had zero shots on target, and failed to complete a single take-on. Adding to that, Fernandes now has just one goal and no assists in seven games against the Premier League Big Six this term. But are Fernandes' underwhelming stats against top Premier League sides a result of Solskjaer's tactics in these games? United's record against the Big Six this season is disappointing to say the least. Obviously, they're not a bad team, but the lack of goals from United players in these games is definitely something to do with their mindset, where they're happy to just settle for a draw. Now to make the matters worse, United faced league leaders Man City in game week 27. There's a high chance that they will play out for a draw, then go for a win, which should be the need of the hour. And Bruno Fernandes at that value looks a bit of a liability. They play West Ham in game week 28 and don't have a game in game week 29, so there's a way out where you could replace Bruno for the likes of Son or even a differential option in Bale and probably get him back in game week 20 or just look elsewhere for better value. Coming to the most expensive player in FPL, Mo Salah. He's also been a bit of a hit and miss this season. He started the season very brightly but has only managed to score 4 goals in his last 13 games for Liverpool. Those aren't great numbers by any stretch of the imagination, especially when his value is around the mid-12 million mark. In FPL terms, he still looks like an expensive gamble, having failed to score against the likes of West Brom, Newcastle, Southampton, Manchester United, Burnley and Tottenham. These were all fixtures in which he was expected to return good point hauls. After scoring goals against Man City and Leicester, he blanked again against the Merseyside rivals Everton and Sheffield United. He has scored 49 FPL points against these teams and alarming 29 of those coming in 3 games against much tougher opposition. The underlying data suggests that Salah is having a very good season still, while the raw figures show his early season goal scoring form was among the best patches any player has ever enjoyed. Further analyzing the Egyptian's threat scores reveal that after he missed a game with COVID-19, Salah found good chances harder to come by. Now has COVID-19 affected Salah's goal scoring efforts? His goals have definitely dried up. His XG is still top in the last 5 game weeks though. His game against Sheffield United was his 6th successive match without an attacking return against a side in the bottom half. Although the fact that he's wasted 7 big chances in those games suggests that it's just a matter of time before the draw ends. It's a bit of a weird one with him. The games until the end of the season look great for Liverpool and they only face Chelsea and Man United who are capable of posing a decent threat to their bid to finish in the top 4. We feel that we can give the Egyptian a couple of more games to show us his worth and defend his position in our squad. I feel overall, Liverpool's fixture run is very hard to ignore and they'll be at the top of their game if they want to finish in the top 4 this season. But you could definitely take that chance and replace him with midfielders who are providing a much higher value than the Liverpool attacker. 
Now there are a couple of really good premium options to replace the likes of Bruno Fernandes and Mo Salah. Our first option is the Man City midfielder Kevin De Bruyne. Kevin De Bruyne is one of the greatest passers of a football the Premier League has ever seen. Man City's Belgian midfielder is supremely gifted with the ball at his feet and prior to Saturday's game against West Ham, the 29-year-old had registered 76 assists in just 174 games. That number is now 77 after KDB delivered another moment of creative magic to help City open the scoring against a defensively strong hammer side. The Belgian delivered a pinpoint long-range pass onto the head of Ruben Diaz and amazingly he managed to do it with his weaker left foot. Absolutely incredible from Kevin De Bruyne. He looks to be back in the frame for Man City and should play more regular football in the coming games. There are a couple of things to note though. Pep generally rotates a lot and with the Champions League game midweek, that is set to continue. Also KDB has just returned from injury and he might take a game or two to get near to full fitness. So then is it really worth having him in your team? He's definitely a better option than Raheem Sterling who's at a huge rotation risk every game week. You just don't know when will Pep play him. KDB is also a great differential among premiums with only 13% ownership right now. So overall I feel it's a risky move and comes at a price. If you're okay taking that additional risk or are chasing ranks in your mini leagues, you should definitely take a punt on him for the next set of fixtures. So KDB is surely an option, but which is the other replacement for Bruno Fernandes and Mo Salah? We have our Spurs differential in midfield, Gareth Bale. Now big things were expected of the 31-year-old when he returned to familiar surroundings in the summer of 2020. A season-long loan at Spurs was supposed to give Bale a chance to put his troubles at Real Madrid behind him. Injuries followed him from Spain to North London with the desired impact back in England slow to materialise. Form has been rediscovered off late though with Bale netting 4 goals in his last 4 appearances in all competitions. Jose Mourinho has been talking him up again having asked some uncomfortable questions at times this term. The Welshman is not disturbed by that and claims to be enjoying his football at the moment. Bale's performances of late suggest that he could play his way into contention for a permanent return to Tottenham. There appears to be little future for him at the Bernabeu, especially if Zidane sticks around and some big decisions will need to be made in the next transfer window. His contract in Madrid is due to run out until 2022, but the Blancos have been looking for a buyer and will be pleased to see an expensive asset putting himself back in the shop window. If he can stay fit and repeat his performance against Burnley consistently, then Spurs can still believe in their Champions League hopes. Obviously at 9.3 million, he doesn't come cheap and is only 0.2 million less than Son, who has had a pretty good season from an FPL point of view. Bale still looks to be a great differential punt with only one person ownership at the moment. Definitely someone to consider if you really want to get huge points and ranks boost. I know it's quite early and a lot could happen between now and the start of next game week, but we have some early transfer thoughts for game week 27. We're looking to replace Harvey Barnes in game week 27 as he won't be featuring in the second game of game week 26 and beyond. Unlucky for all the managers who just got him in, feels like a transfer wasted on the Leicester City player. We are looking to get in Lingard from West Ham who has been in great form. He won't play a game in game week 28, but we can keep him on the bench for that one and play a 3-4-3. This could easily change if Jack Grealish is fit. We have the money to stretch our budget to Grealish, so that is definitely on the cards. Our second option is to replace Loughton in defence if we decide to play a back four with Diaz, Stones, Luke Shaw and another defender. Dallas might not be that effect against a tight West Ham defence and we would in fact go for the reverse move. We're thinking of getting a West Ham defender in for Loughton. Now this time, we have the money for both Sufal and Cresswell, with the latter having a higher goal threat. So we'll see, if we want to save that additional money, we'll go Sufal, otherwise it's Cresswell this week. Our third transfer approach this week could be a double up on Spurs, moving out Bruno Fernandes for either Son or a risky option in Bale. Both Tottenham options look tempting and with Bruno Fernandes most likely to blank against the best defence in the league, this could be a great transfer in game week 27. It would depend if any of these players get a suspension or injury, but these are our early thoughts for our team next week. Guys, let us know in the comments below if you're thinking of replacing Mo Salah or Bruno Fernandes this week. That'll be all for this episode. Hope all of you end this game week with a huge green arrow. We'll cover more of our game week 27 preparation including team selection and top captain picks in our next video. That'll be out this Friday. Hope this video will help you make some informed bold calls for the coming game weeks. If you liked today's video and found this useful, please hit that like button. It would really mean a lot to us. Subscribe to our channel Insanely Football if you're new around here. Make sure you hit the bell icon if you want to get notified of all our upcoming content. Have a good week ahead and I'll see you in Saners next time. <laughs>